This conference will now be recorded. All right, folks, so good evening. I appreciate you uh, attending class this evening. Um, I know that this is the first time that we're not spending a, a, a Monday night on campus as a result of being uh, uh, you know, quarantined, truly, this in this semester. So, um, you know, we've done all that we can to provide you with, and I have, as far as the videos that are posted on YouTube, and uh, if you have any issues, you know, you can check out my channel. If you have an issue, let me know. Um, but all of the, uh, th there are videos present for you uh, to review all of the uh, structures that you need to know in order to uh, uh, take the uh, practical exam number two, okay? So if you have any questions, let me know. So as we're looking at uh, chapter 10, we already uh, began looking at the PowerPoint. And so tonight I'm really not gonna focus on the PowerPoint. I'm going to focus on these notes here that we have that I've prepared for you all. Uh, this has taken a lot of time and uh, effort, and so I hope that you'll find this very helpful. I believe you will. Okay, uh, so let's take a look, and, and some of this will again will be review, but review is okay. You know, reviewing and, and going over this material, you, you should do quite a bit of it actually, and in order to uh, process it and memorize the information that you need to know uh, for test number four as well as the final exam. So we talked about the, the fact that uh, nervous tissue is excitable. So nervous tissue, we mentioned about how there is a, uh, a gradient, an ionic uh, gradient between uh, the ions outside of the uh, plasma membrane of the nerve and inside of the plasma membrane of the neuron. And how, uh, in particular, that resting membrane potential, that little bit positive on the outside, a little bit negative on the inside, and the difference in the ions, whether they are out or in, and we'll look at this in a few minutes here. Actually, I'll show you an image in just a moment I would like to review with you all. Um, allows for and creates this potential, okay? And this potential, we would say, this resting membrane potential is measured at a negative 70 millivolts, okay? So on average, it's about negative 70 millivolts. And so know that we can generate action potentials. And also, I don't know that I've mentioned this term to you or, uh, before, but I'm gonna say it tonight, uh, graded potentials. And we're going to see that action potentials are generated and travel down an axon, whereas graded potentials travel the dendrites to the soma, to the body of the neuron. Okay, so we'll be talking about and going over that. Um, you'll notice here that it says here that the uh, central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. All else, folks, peripheral nervous system. So the cranial nerves, the 12 pairs uh, of cranial nerves. Yeah, there we go as far as the... Uh, um, peripheral nervous system, the spinal nerves, and those bilateral spinal nerves exiting off of the spine, also peripheral nervous system. When you think of a nerve, you think of peripheral nervous system, okay? So we are going to be discussing and going over that in more detail. <clears throat> You'll see here as far as these divisions, as far as the somatic, autonomic, and enteric. So somatic, we know, goes to the uh, uh, skeletal muscle, and so we have voluntary control over what takes place with the somatic nervous system as far as controlling of the skeletal muscles of our body and, and realizing that's also uh, in the frontal lobe of the brain. I need you to remember that, the frontal lobe, because we talked about in lab, we talked about the precentral gyrus. That would be the primary motor cortex, the precentral gyrus. So you'll see that in the, in the brain when we talk about that in more detail, but I'm giving it to you now, so just to put in the back of your mind there. So that precentral gyrus is the um, primary motor cortex, okay? So that ability for us to control our skeletal muscles, this would be frontal lobe of the brain, okay? The autonomic nervous system, this is the automatic nervous system, recall, I've said that before, right? That that automatic nervous system, so we're having issues where we're not actually consciously controlling what's taking place and what's going on, and the divisions of the autonomic nervous system are the sympathetic and parasympathetic. When we think of a sympathetic nervous system, we think of preparing the body for action, fight or flight, we're ready for to do something, right? And it's only under short-term times of our, of our day and of our life where we have sympathetic control. Parasympathetic control is primarily what the body is under as far as this rest and digest. Remember, I also mentioned the uh, acronym SLUD, S-L-U-D-D, -D. Uh, salivation, lacrimation, so salivation, you have production of saliva, lacrimation, production of tears, um, urination, uh, digestion, and defecation, right? Those are all 
functions controlled via the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. And then the enteric nervous system is really, we, we quote unquote, the brain of the gut. So we're, we're looking at, so there's an autonomy of the nervous system as far as the gut is concerned, as the digestive system is concerned. You'll see that there are quite a few terms that you need to process and know, right? And these terms will carry on over into next semester. So a nerve is a bundle of right, many axons outside of the central nervous system. A ganglia would be small masses of neuron cell bodies present in the central nervous system. So whether we're in outside or inside of the nervous central nervous system, remember it's brain and spinal cord, you need to keep this in mind. And you're gonna see that there's a few other terms that we're going to have that are also associated with central nervous system, peripheral nervous system. We'll look at the neuroglia, the support cells of both uh, the central and peripheral nervous system in just a moment. A plexus, we, we term that, see that term plexus and read that there. It's an extensive network of neurons and we're gonna see, so example, the brachial plexus would be these nerves that actually help to uh, innervate the upper extremities, right? Brachial plexus. So we'll look at that in more detail. Uh, sensory receptor, this sensory receptor is actually receiving information, right? Receiving information and taking it to, uh, via the peripheral nervous system, taking this information to the peripheral nervous system. So we have in the nervous system basic functions, right? There's a sensory function, there's an inter integrative function. So we're integrating this information that's being received by the sensory receptors, processing it, and then um, then doing some type of motor output. And I didn't, I just, uh, give me a moment here, let me, here, ganglia, it's outside, inside. Ganglia would be inside central nervous system. Yeah, look here, it's on your, sorry, wait, so wait, actually, um, sorry. No, ganglia would be, wait, <sighs> did I make a mistake? All right, now I need to, uh, I, I will, <laughs> yeah, hold on a moment. And I, I, yes, so the ganglia, I apologize. Dr. Prone at times. Yeah, it is outside, it, yeah, so. Yeah, because the chain ganglia and such, yes, I'm sorry, you know, and it just, uh, you get a lot of these terms, even myself can get a little confused, but so think of this as far as the uh, the chain ganglia of the um, the sympathetic nervous system. Let me show you an image of that. Yep, let me show you an image of that in just one second. Let me minimize and move structures around a little bit. <clears throat> and that is correct, it's outside of the central nervous system and I'm gonna show you the sympathetic chain ganglia, okay? So let's take a look. Here we go. Okay, so let's take a look at here as far as these Sympathetic chain ganglia, which would be bilateral. Here we go. This is a good image. Okay. So this image right here represents and shows you that as far as for the autonomic nervous system, for the parasympathetic and sympathetic branches, the sympathetic chain ganglia are bilaterally uh, adjacent to the spine. Okay. And these will have, there will be uh, synapses that will occur here with the uh, and we'll get into this more detail regarding the autonomic nervous system next semester, but just say that there are synapses, there are connections that take place here in the sympathetic chain ganglia, peripheral nervous system, outside of the central nervous system, connecting to, but not in the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord. There we go. Okay, very good. Let's go back to the notes here. I'm going to turn on my fan for a moment. I'll be right back.
Okay, very good. All right, folks, let's go on to the pathway of an impulse. Okay, so we said before there that sensory receptors are receiving information. Recall these terms, afferent and efferent. Okay, so afferent, we're actually receiving information coming to the central nervous system. Efferent, which would be the motor division, which would send out motor output, would be information going away from uh, the central nervous system and going to a muscle or a gland. Now you see here, as far as the pathway of this impulse, so sensory division, we're receiving information, it's afferent, then the pet travels the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system, then there is some type of integration that takes place. Going back then, the information will be going to the peripheral nervous system and then out via the uh, motor output to a muscle or a gland, okay? Now the support cells we looked at earlier, last week there prior to the uh, break, um, recall that the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, peripheral nervous system, it's easy to remember and to memorize right, very easily that the terms begin with the letter S as far as the Schwann cells and the satellite cells. The central nervous system has the astrocytes, the oligodendrocytes, micro, microglia, and also, or AKA also known as the microglial cells and the ependymal cells. Now the astrocytes are very analogous to the satellite cells, okay, as far as their function is concerned. We'll look at this in a moment. The oligodendrocytes, very analogous to, as far as function is concerned, the Schwann cells. Both are involved with myelinating axons, okay? Now, know this, that not all axons are myelinated, okay? But a myelination, um, this ability to, uh, to really cover the neurons, the axons themselves, and allow for quicker transmission of the action potential, is very important, but it's not necessary throughout the whole nervous system. And really, when we think of white and gray matter, gray, well, gray matter would be tissue present within the nervous system that is not myelinated. Myelinated tissue would be white matter, okay? And we'll look at the microglial and uh, the ependymal cells. So let's look here, as far as astrocytes are concerned. So astrocytes, just as the, the name seems to represent there, they're star-shaped in their appearance. Uh, they're the largest and most abundant present within the central nervous system, okay? And really this BBB, what does that stand for? The blood-brain barrier. This is a protective barrier between uh, the central nervous system, the cerebral spinal fluid, and uh, the uh, cardiovascular system, okay? So there really is a protective barrier here that only lets certain substances cross the blood-brain barrier, right? And this can very much uh, protect what takes place within the central nervous system. Uh, support and nutrition, also very important for the astrocytes. And this would be, uh, again, analogous to the satellite cells doing the same thing in the function-wise as far as the peripheral nervous system is concerned. Microglial cells involved in having an immune-like function, involved in phagocytosis. Recall that this is a form of endocytosis cell eating, where they're actually able to remove cellular debris. This would be uh, cells that are, that are dead or tissue that's, that's no longer uh, use, useful, uh, whether they be uh, microglial cells or whether they be uh, neurons okay? and microbes. So this phagocytic activity takes place with the microglial cells. The ependymal cells think CSF. Think CSF production, cerebral spinal fluid. And so where would these be present? It makes sense. You, when I, in the lab, we looked at the uh, lateral, the sagittal view of the uh, human head. And we looked at, we went over the neural components, the neurological components that you need to know for your practical exam coming up. Okay? And so the, I showed you in the third ventricle, right, at the roof of the third ventricle, the superior aspect of the third ventricle, uh, which contains, so the third ventricle contains the hypothalamus and the thalamus. And at the roof, we would have the, uh, the choroid plexus. So this choroid plexus, in conjunction with the ependymal cells, will work. This choroid plexus is a vascularity, blood vessels, that will work and produce cerebral spinal fluid, okay? And involved in protecting and nourishing the central nervous system. The oligodendrocytes are involved in, just, they're analogous to the Schwann cells, they're involved in myelin formation or myelination of the axon, okay? 
And so you'll see here that, and recall that I mentioned to you this before, and let's go, let me share with you my, the PowerPoint images here. So let's go right here. Let me do this way. So here we are. So here you're seeing that the oligodendrocytes, one oligodendrocyte can myelinate multiple areas of an axon and axons, whereas one here we go, Schwann cell, right, uh, can only myelinate one portion, one area of an axon. So you need multiple Schwann cells in order to uh, myelinate an axon. Okay, whereas one oligodendrocyte can myelinate one and more axons. Okay, so it's just they're just a little bit different as far as their ability and their function. And the satellite cells, again, like I said, analogous to the uh, astrocytes, okay, support nutrition, okay, very important. Characteristics of neurons. So extreme longevity, because we know that other than for the olfactory epithelium and for the area of the hippocampus where we have a uh, storage of long-term memory right uh, these are areas that can that actually are areas that can reproduce but it's but and, and as far as the full understanding of how this is and how this takes place um still you know still being worked on as far as an understanding but know that extreme longevity so you know we have patients that live over 100 years old. So there are still neurons present within their body that have been there for, for many years. Highly metabolic, right? So this high metabolic rate, um, so we're needing oxygen and we're needing nutrition, glucose. So above air, all areas of the body, so it's the heart and the brain that require and that really we need to protect as far as if someone is has experienced some type of uh, catastrophic event and to making sure that we're pumping uh, the blood through the body and we're pumping oxygen to particular to the brain in order to prevent brain damage and, and death of uh, neurons. And, you know, we'll talk about, uh, we'll review again and let's actually, let's do this right now. As far as I can go to this image, we just, I was kept on this image here. So you'll see here as far as the different types of neurons. So we have multipolar neuron, bipolar and unipolar neurons, right? And so here, when we're th when you think about a neuron, you're thinking about this bipolar neuron. And you'll see here that we have these multiple processes, hence the term multipolar. So we have these dendrites that are afferent, A-F-F-E-R-A-N-T, right? Afferent, they're bringing information to the soma, bringing information to the soma. And so these would be the, the electrical activity here would be called a graded potential. So again, I'm saying that term again to you, a graded potential. So the graded potential would bring information to the soma, the neuron cell body. An action potential, or you see here the term impulse, would travel down an axon to the axon terminals, and whether it's to skeletal muscle or to a gland, okay? Um, that's what's taking place as far as uh, the axon is concerned. So the axon would be efferent, E-F-F-E-R-E-N-T, okay? And you'll also see here that we have, so this is a Schwann cell. Here's a Schwann cell. Here's a Schwann cell. Do you see that there? So we have these multiple Schwann cells, and then there are spaces between the Schwann cells. We call these nodes of Ranvier, nodes of Ranvier, okay? And you'll see that term come up in the, in the presentation. Also, you're seeing that here, okay? Now, all right. So also, I want you, I wanna say something to you. So when you think of this, the term myelination, right? And I said to you that it's an insulator and it, and it really does help to speed the conduction of these impulses, these action potentials. Know that the impulse will kind of jump from node to node, passing through, passing over, through the, the myelination and jumping from these nodes of Ranvier, these spaces, these gaps between the myelin, okay? That's, that's also important for you to realize, okay? So we call that saltatory conduction, actually, when it's 
jumping from node to node, right? Um, oh yeah, what I wanted to mention to you all too, also was that this myelin here, right? What goes on with this, with the, with the Schwann cell would be that this myelin is actually the plasma membrane of the Schwann cell. So a plasma membrane is what? It's a lipid, it's a fat. So know that this myelin is composed of fatty tissue, the plasma membrane of the cell, in particular of the Schwann cell or the oligodendrocyte, no matter, you know, depending upon, dependent upon where we're at as far as central nervous system or peripheral nervous system. So the, the cell body, again, AKA also known as the soma, contains the nucleus, the cytoplasm, organelles, the typical, so rough ER, smooth ER, right? Golgi apparatus. These nissel bodies, what are these? These are clusters of rough ER and free ribosomes, right? So ribosomes that are not attached to the rough ER, the ER that's called rough ER, they would be free. And again, ribosomes involved with uh, protein um, production, protein synthesis, okay? A dendrite, again, axon, again, graded potential, I said, for the dendrites, AFF, E-R-E-N-T, afferent, receiving input to the uh, soma, and then the axon taking uh, information away from, so efferent, E-F-F, E-R-E-N-T, uh, this action potential will then go to travel down the to the axon terminal, and then cause some type of release of a neurotransmitter of some type of activity communication that we would call the synapse. So recall, I mentioned to you that the neuromuscular junction is a synapse. It's a chemical synapse because we have a neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, being released into that gap, that synaptic cleft. Right? Recall that. So that's that synapse is an area of communication between the nervous system and, in particular, neuro at the neuromuscular junction, the nervous system and the muscular system. Right? The axon hillock, this is an area where the action potential is generated. It's it's kind of a, a cone-shaped part of the, the cell body. I'm going to show that to you. I'm going to refer back to our image right here. And let's see here. And you'll see, take a look right here. See this cone-shaped area right here? That's, that's very similar to, that's the graded potential. Well, look at this cone-shaped area right here for the axon. This is the axon hillock. And then right here would be the initial segment. So the axon hillock is this cone-shaped area, kind of an upside down pyramid, right? You've got the apex here, you've got the base right here, axon hillock, initial segment, and then we have these nodes of Ranvier. Okay. And again, we know about, we, we recall the axon terminal is at the end of the axon, which contains synaptic vesicles of neurotransmitters. And in particular, we recall the neuromuscular junction, that nerve muscle junction, those axon terminals for the nerve, for the axon would be containing uh, acetylcholine in those um, synaptic vesicles. Little containers, little uh, oval shaped containers. I apologize, I have to turn off the notification on my phone, I don't know why. there. All right. So now I'm not going to go back to the image, but then you, I've already showed you the image as far as uh, the different types of neurons, the multipolar, bipolar, and unipolar. Okay. And so you'll, you can review that and go over that, but know that again, it deals with the amount of processes. So multipolar, multiple dendrites, one axon. Okay. Bipolar, an axon and a dendrite. Unipolar, and, and then, again, all of these have a soma, a cell body, neuron cell body. And then the unipolar has a, a, a structure, a process that functions as primarily as a an axon, okay? But it also can, the, that axon, that one process can act as a dendrite also, bringing information to the neuron cell body. Now this myelination, okay? I'm gonna talk about a couple of uh, disease processes that can occur as a result of um, an autoimmune response, the body attacking its own cell, okay? So in the case of myelination, right, we have these sheaths are multi-layered lipoprotein covering. What that means is that 
we have the axon. And usually what I would do is, and next time that I do that, next time that we have class, I want to, I'll do this for you. I'll demonstrate this to you. But imagine a, like a Ziploc bag. And imagine in that Ziploc bag, you fill it up with a little bit of uh, liquid, okay? And imagine that that liquid would represent the cytoplasm of, okay, say like a, a Schwann cell, all right? And this Schwann cell will be able to wrap its plasma membrane, the plastic bag represents the plasma membrane. It'll wrap around an axon and provide this uh, ability to um, really coat and cover a section of the axon. And this will allow for insulation of that axon and allow for speedy transmission of action potentials. You see the term here, that nodes of Ranvier. These nodes of Ranvier are spaces, gaps in that myelin sheath. And we're going to have jumping from node to node of the action potential. And that term, and, it, and you know, I'm just gonna write it down here. Please write this down for me. Okay, just write this term. It's called saltatory induction. Okay. Right. Saltatory, so, no, not salutary, no, it's saltatory. I'll check on the spelling of that, but that should be the, the proper spelling is salted. Let me. Spelling isn't my strong suit, folks. I apologize. I believe that I have spelled it correctly, though. I'm just going to control. Yeah, saltatory. Saltatory. That is correct. Okay. That is the correct spelling. I just wanted to confirm that. Add to the dictionary, and we're good. So saltaturgy induction, this is that jumping from node to node of the action potentials of a myelinated axon. Know that there are non-myelinated axons, okay? But those that are myelinated, they have those gaps, those spaces between them, right? Demyelination would be then the loss or destruction of these myelin sheaths. This is a problem. This is going to affect the ability for transmission of these um, action potentials to their distal portion, their, the area of uh, the axon terminal. And this can affect the communication that's taking place. This can affect function. Uh, multiple sclerosis is, is, a, is a, a challenging illness to be uh, diagnosed with, okay? It uh, affects the central nervous system, demyelination of the central nervous system axons, uh, turns them into non-functioning lesions called sclerosis, right? So this is a, um, hardening what takes place within and destruction of the myelin, okay? Visual and speech disturbances, muscle weakness, tingling, paralysis, incontinence. Folks, understand that, you know, this is this is affecting what's going on in the brain, right? This central nervous system, right? Um, Guillain-Barre, okay? So I've had patients with, uh, that have, uh, quite a few patients over the years that I've treated that have uh, suffered with multiple sclerosis, it, we do not have a cure for multiple sclerosis, know that. We have treatments that can help to slow the process and help with the different symptoms uh, that occur, uh, but we do not have a cure for multiple sclerosis, right? Now, Guillain-Barre is also a demyelinating autoimmune disorder, okay? And it affects the peripheral nervous system. And what can happen with Guillain-Barre is that uh, this can affect the ability for a patient to uh, to walk, it can cause paralysis, and if it affects the respiratory muscles, this can be uh, deadly. If it's not, if there's no intervention, the patient would would die without uh, being intubated and being able to have a, put on some type of respirator. And such. So, um, the remarkable thing with Guillain-Barre is that patients can be hospitalized and put in a uh, in the intensive care ward uh, for a period of time, and then actually recuperate, and and have um, minimal to no lasting uh, effects, symptoms down the road. It's uh, it's just a crazy thing. And, and dealing with um, etiology, uh, possible uh, uh, virus related, viral related, um, it's still undetermined as far as uh, true causes of Guillain-Barre, right? The term uh, white and gray matter, I've mentioned to you this before, as far as the white matter, myelinated axons. Gray matter, neuron cell bodies, dendrites, unmyelinated axons, axon terminals, support cells, the neuroglia, right? So these are all considered the gray matter. 
the white matter, the myelinated axons. And so when we look at the central nervous system, uh, we see that. So recall the uh, the sagittal head, and let's let's go back to that. Let's take a look. Okay. Here we go. So as we're looking at this sagittal head, what do we see here? We see what's the white. The white is the arbor vitae, and that's the white matter present within the cerebellum. So the gray matter is on the outer portion, right, and, and interspersed, and the white matter is deep within. So in the central nervous system, the gray matter is the outer portion. So the cortex, the cerebral cortex, is the outer portion of the central nervous system as far as the brain is concerned, and this would be then the gray matter. The inner portion would be the white matter interspersed with gray matter throughout the the brain, the, the actual brain itself. Now know that the spinal cord, right? So we have here pons, we have here then medulla oblongata, and then the spinal cord. Spinal cord is opposite. The outer portion is white matter. The inner portion is the gray matter. So, I know that I've give, I've said that to you and it was in the notes, but I just want to uh, yeah, let's do okay. The brain and spinal cord opposite as far as white and gray matter okay so depending upon where you're at the gray matter outer yes white is inner and spinal cord gray inner white outer gray. Okay. okay so i don't know. I can just read that. Yeah, so brain and spinal cord. All right, very good. So know that the white and gray matter, you need to know what that represents. And then as far as presentation in the brain and also spinal cord. So in the central nervous system, two areas of the central nervous system, they're the opposites regarding uh, the presentation of gray and white matter. Okay. Uh, neuron cell bodies would be present within the central nervous system as a nucleus and the ganglion, ganglia, uh, neuron cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. And I was correct in the beginning there and I just got a little, uh, you know, <laughs> a brain fart. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> the uh, Now here also, so neuron, uh, nuclei, nucleus, central nervous system, tract in the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, ganglion, neuron cell bodies, nerve in the peripheral nervous system, okay? So these are the axons, axons present in the central nervous system, their tracts, axons present in the peripheral nervous system, nerves. Neuron cell bodies in the central nervous system, nucleus, neurons in the, neuron cell bodies in the uh, peripheral nervous system, ganglia or ganglion. I'll write that there also this week. Now, uh, what you'll see here is then what we're showing you is uh, different types of movement of material within the axon, okay? Movement of material within the axon. So know that the axon itself does not contain organelles, okay? The axon does not contain any organelles, any of that. All it, uh, it will allow for 
really it's just a, a mode of transportation, a conduit that an action potential will travel and get to then the axon terminal, which will contain uh, the, um, again, the synaptic vesicles containing the neurotransmitters, which will then be released at the uh, synapse, okay? So this type of movement, now I need you to, 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 to know these two types of movement, okay? So movement away from the cell body, this is within the axoplasm. So look here, folks, axoplasm is the cytoplasm of the axon, axolemma, and I mentioned this to you last, last week, is the plasma membrane of the axon, okay? So anterograde is movement away from the cell body in the axoplasm. Retrograde movement is moves organelles and materials along the surface of microtubules, transports toward the cell body uh, for use of or, or for use or for recycling within the cell body. So this movement of in and out, uh, back and forth between inside of the axon, the axoplasm, is important. Why? Because some nerve damaging viruses and bacteria use this retrograde movement right, of axonal movement, transporting su substances towards the, oh, and that was just an autosoma, the cell body. So polio, rabies, herpes simplex virus, tetanus toxin, these all use this retrograde movement toward the soma, right, within the axoplasm. Uh, as far as uh, we have here, so neurons have the ability to respond to a stimulus and convert it into an action potential. We get that, we know that, okay? So this stimulus, any change in the environment strong enough to stimulate an action potential. So what's going on is that we have this ability um, as a result of the ion concentration outside of the cell and inside of the cell, as far as inside of the uh, axon itself, positive on the outside, negative on the inside. Let's take a look for a moment here and just review image-wise. Let's look at this one right here. Okay, so here we go. So here's the cell membrane, the plasma membrane, okay? So outside of the cell, positive. Inside of the cell, negative, right? So intracellular, inside of the cell, extracellular, outside of the cell, okay? So look at this here, folks. So we have here, sodium ion concentration greater extracellularly as well as chloride ions and then intracellularly greater potassium ion concentration and greater what do these a's represent but um, actual proteins so negatively charged proteins so again closer to the plasma membrane positive negative this will change this is the resting membrane potential right here positive on the outside, negative on the inside. This will change when ions are moving in such a fashion that more ions move in one direction, causing a change from positive on the outside to negative on the inside. We call that depolarization. So we have then negative on the outside, positive on the inside. We've depolarized the plasma membrane. And then this will then in turn, as more and more sodium ions are moving because Sodium ions are the ones that always move first. Potassium ions follow. So we'll see that we'll have both ions are always moving as a result of leak channels. We're going to look at that in a moment. But know that, remember these are these different types of channels, whether they're always open, this is a leak channel. So potassium ions are going from high concentration to low concentration, see? High to low. It's always open. The gate's always open. But gated channels would be something like a voltage gated channel where we have some type of electrical event taking place, a change in the voltage, which will incur and will be the key to open the gate. That key opens the gate and then specific ions will travel, okay, through that gate. So let's, let's go back for a moment. I have in my notes here, I have all of this information for you all. So let's step by step. Action potential, aka also known as a nerve impulse. It's an electric, electrical signal that travels due to the movement of ions across the plasma membrane of the axon. Isn't that just what I said to you, right? So this action potential, and I've mentioned this to you, I've showed you, uh, last class we had that video that was helping to you to get a, a grasp or an understanding of the action potential, what takes place. 
So you'll see here that neurons, electrically excitable, right? Due to the voltage difference across the membrane. Again, it's due to this, this, right? There's a difference here and here as a result of, as a result of that difference in the polarity, right? Positive on the outside, negative on the inside because of these ions present and also these negatively charged ions present within the inside of the cell intracellularly, okay? Know that, like you'll see here also, there are sodium and chloride ions inside as well as out, but their greater concentration is here. So that concentration gradient, one side has more than the other, will allow for then this charge to, to, to be present. And it, can be and it can be measured and it's negative 70 millivolts. I want to show you something here also. Here we go. And I will share these images with you folks, okay, on uh, in documents and resources. So does this look a little confusing? It might, but don't let it confuse you. I, I want you to see something here. You you have an idea and understanding, a basic understanding, and seeing here as far as so if this is zero, there's 50, here's negative 50, negative 100. So this would represent negative 70 millivolts, okay, it's eight millivolts. And so this is the resting membrane potential. More sodium ions in the extracellular fluid, more chloride ions in the extracellular fluid. As far as then that resting membrane, resting membrane potential also has um, greater concentration of potassium ions intracellularly, as well as uh, negatively charged proteins, measured as negative 70 millivolts on average. So this is the resting membrane potential, when there's more of a movement of ions, right, and a change in that, we'll end up starting to go more positive and more positive. And we would say that this is a depolarization event. We've depolarized that positive on the outside, negative on the inside. It's changing to negative on the outside, positive on the inside. In turn, an action potential will be produced. Now, do we need to have a return to the resting membrane potential? Yes, to go back to positive on the outside, negative on the inside. This is this repolarization that will occur. And it's gonna go a little bit more uh, negative, it's called hyperpolarization, before it actually returns to that resting membrane potential. Okay. It's important for you to go back to that, the video that from last class. And so you'll see there as far as uh, we're looking at uh, the different, uh, what's taking place as far as an action potential is concerned. You're going to see in a moment, and let's see here. I'm gonna come back to this in just one moment, but you'll see here that I have given you as far as steps, steps in the action potential right here, and kind of giving you a little bit more information there. So it's at the end of the PowerPoint, at the end of the, the note packet here, okay? Let me go back. All right, to right here. So here you'll see as far as voltage, so it's a potential energy caused by a separation of opposite charges. Again, positive on the outside, negative on the inside. Communication that's gonna take place is our action potentials and graded potentials. I said to you where these are located, where these occur. And so you'll see here as far as the action potential travels down an axon, the graded potentials travel the dendrites to the soma. These, dendri these graded potentials, it's more of a, uh, a shorter event, whereas an action potential can be quite a long event as far as a traveling uh, quite a long distance, whereas the distance at a graded potential travels, not very long at all, okay? short distance. So I've mentioned to you regarding what comprises the resting membrane potential, the separation of positive and negative electrical charges, right? And this is a form of potential energy. So we have, it can be measured as that negative 70 millivolts. In neurons, resting membrane potential is around 70, negative 70 millivolts, right? We would say that there's polarity. There's a positive and negative, right? Positive outside, negative on the inside. Now, the different types of channels that ions will pass through, these channels are proteins. So the channels are proteins. Okay, so when we look at this image here, we're looking at, this is a protein right here. 
This is a potassium ion channel. Only potassium ions will travel from high concentration to low concentration, okay? A leak channel, they're always open. And so specific uh, leak channels for specific ions. And so they will move from high concentration to low concentration. We say that that's diffusion, okay? A chemically gated or ligand gated channel, right? Is, a, is allowing for an open open in response to this ligand, this, this chemical. In the case of at the neuromuscular junction, at the motor end plate, we have, we have neurotransmitter acetylcholine. We will interact with these acetylcholine ligand gated channels at their specific receptors for acetylcholine and allow for an opening of the channel to occur. So the, the neurotransmitter, the ligand, this is the key. Right? So it's the key to open the channel. Okay? The, the ligand, the, the neurotransmitter. In voltage-gated ion channels, they do what? They response, they're they're opening as a result of and as a response to some type of a chemical, not a chemical, um, an electrical event that'll occur. Uh, voltage, right? So this electricity, this bioelectricity will allow for and be the key to open a voltage-gated channel. Okay. So now ions move along, right? They're chemical gradient. They're going from high concentration to low concentration. This is called diffusion, right? And we know that this electrical gradients are very important for this to occur and for the polarity to exist. Now, factors that contribute to the resting membrane potential. So this unequal distribution of ions, right? Unequal distribution of ions. Right? We know that there's greater concentrations here and here, depending upon what you're looking at. Potassium ions, negatively charged proteins. Sodium ions, negatively charged uh, chloride ions. These concentrations are different from one side to the other, depending upon what's going on as far as at the plasma membrane, right? as far as allowing for movement of these ions. So an unequal distribution of ions, inability of most ions to leave the cell. So what goes on is that, that there, yeah, so some are gonna move and some will move out, some will move in, um, but it's controlled. And know that sodium potassium pumps. If you recall, I mentioned to you regarding this that those are pumps that will move against the concentration gradients, right? I said that sodium potassium pumps will move against the concentration gradient. So if sodium, so let's look here at this image. Higher concentration of sodium ions here. So where will sodium ions move from what area to one area as far as concentration is concerned? So diffusion, they're going from the concentration gradient from high to low. So sodium ions will move from outside to in. They're gonna move, so if there's a, if there's a leak channel right here, it would move from here outside to inside. That would be sodium ions. You'll see here this leak channel, potassium ions are going from high concentration to low concentration, right? They're traveling down these concentration gradients. So if sodium ions are high here and they're moving inward for leak channels, for gated channels, um, how about the sodium potassium pump? It's gonna move sodium ions from here to outside. And it's actually moved three sodium ions and two potassium ions from here to inside against the concentration gradients. This helps to no, this helps to maintain the resting membrane potential. Okay. Of a little positive on the outside, a little negative on the inside of the plasma membrane. Okay. So you'll see here I've given you this information, depolarization, it's the membrane has become more positive and so as a result it's going to there's going to be a switching taking place from this positive on the outside to a negative on the outside and a positive on the inside that switching in polarity is a depolarization event and that will produce this electricity this action potential that will travel down let's let's go here that will travel 
down the axon to the axon terminals. Okay, this electricity, this action potential, will travel down the axon to the axon, the axon terminals, and cause an event to take place at that synapse, that area of communication. It's a lot of information. I know it's 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 a little challenging and it's it's kind of hard to get grasp and understand. Um, I'm going to give you some information at the end as far as a couple of more videos that you should look up and review, okay? And that we will that I will share with you all also. Okay. So an action potential, or we call it an impulse or a nerve impulse, sequence of rapidly occurring events that decrease and eventually reverse the membrane potential, that polarization that change from positive outside, negative inside, to negative outside, positive inside. That's that change, that depolarization. There's polarity there, right? And then restore to its resting state, a repolarization. So let's look here as far as what it says here. So we start off with the resting membrane potential. There's depolarization. There's a repolarization. I said to you that there's a hyperpolarization that goes a little bit more negative than the resting membrane potential and then returns to that resting membrane potential. And so you'll see here, that's this image here. Seeing where we start off with resting membrane potential, reaching that threshold potential of that movement of those ions to the point where it creates a change and it goes from positive on the outside to negative on the outside and positive on the inside. That change is depolarization, which will produce this action potential, which will, once it's produced, will travel from proximal to distal, from the axon hillock, that, remember that triangular area? The axon hillock, which is, right here, this axon hillock, that's where the action potential begins, the initial segment and travels, once it starts, it's going to travel all the way down to the axon terminal. Okay. So according to the all or none principle, once the stimulus reaches threshold, and we're going to show you that there, as far as the action potential, it, it's going to just continually, it's going to be produced, and it's going to just pass from proximal to distal, from the soma to the axon uh, terminal. Okay. Uh, here. Let's look, review this and see here. So this is the resting member of potential. Depolarization, threshold stimulus causes sodium and potassium ion channels to open. Um, sodium channels are the ones that open first, right? See here, first only sodium rushes into the axon. Then, then and this causes a change in the polarity. And then we're going to have then a, want a, a return to the polarity. So this would be a repolarization when the potassium channels will open and they'll rush and they'll move across, okay? Um, restoring the rest to the, the resting electrical conditions, that resting memory and potential. Again, it's gonna be a little bit hyperpolarized, even greater than negative 70 millivolts, and then return to that resting membrane potential. And then again, know that those sodium potassium pumps are going to contribute to this res restoration of the resting membrane potential. This is something folks that, um, I know it's a hard concept. I know it's not simple or easy. Um, try to do all that I can to explain it. Um, but something that uh, reviewing this over and over, asking some questions, uh, watching some video, oh, getting this video, this uh, um, visual input and the audio input just helps you to kind of grasp it a little bit better than just seeing it on paper like this. But I've given you, tried to do all that I can to give you step by step what's taking place and occurring. Um, Two more terms that I would like you to, to see here. And again, two, it might not make so much sense right off the very beginning, but it will as you help to process this information. Absolute refractory period. So when I say something is absolute, absolutely, it's going to happen. It's definitely going to happen, right? So an absolute refractory period is where um, once an action potential is produced, the at the segment Right where it's been produced, and then when you, it moves on down, it moves from proximal to distal, so it's moving. No, wrong one. This one. When it's moving from one area to the next, 
right? So the action potential does not travel backward. It does not travel backward. Dendrites, graded potentials from the dendrite, this information will go to the soma. Axon, information going away, right? Efferent, E-F-F-E-R-E-N-T. So as such, the absolute refractory period means that once an action potential is produced and it's going in this direction, right? It's going prox proximal to distal, we cannot have another action potential right as soon as this one just as it moved from one space to the next, one node to the next. We can't just have an initial one, uh, another action potential being produced. There's a little bit of a lag time, okay? This lag time is important. And so you'll see here that, um, so even a very strong stimulus cannot initiate another action potential. Once it's been produced and it travels, then another one after at the end, then another one can be reproduced again. So relative refractory period. This is a time period where if a stimulus is strong enough, then an action potential can be produced. Keep these in the back of your mind a little bit there, but just I want you to, to really process and try to understand as best you can what an action potential is, what's taking place with it. Okay. 